You've got to be careful with that. Because <laughs> theology books are not cheap. So. Yeah, but the, the, uh, the cost of your luggage is not. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you've got a danker down there, 50 bucks. That's yeah. um, All right. Something to this up. He has, to my knowledge, been a Christian. 
But I like him because he's an honest atheist. And they're so rare. They really are. Um, they're so rare that they will, they, will, they will look at the facts and actually say what the facts are. They want to say, just give me the facts according to my presuppositions that I can judge what the facts are. They don't like to look at the facts, but if you can get them to just look at the facts, it's pretty powerful uh, what's there. So, what can even an atheist know about, about Jesus? He can know Jesus was a real human, contrary to uh, most Wikipedia style arguments. And still, a huge one in who will say, don't you know that Jesus uh, didn't even exist? And if you've never heard someone say that before, and you're a 19-year-old college student, a 21 year old junior at your school, or maybe even a professor in your classroom, and they say that to you, it's really easy to get that kind of gut check stab and say, uh, What? Maybe he didn't. How do I know he is? Well, by faith, because of Bible. Well, that's fine, but that's also not going to convince them that they're going to succeed in the one day. You need to know what you believe, right? And just go right at it. Um, the thing is, of all the arguments a person can make against Jesus to say he doesn't exist is the most ignorant one possible. It is, it is profoundly ignorant, asinine, um, because you don't read the Bible to know this man named Jesus of Nazareth. He is attempted to. Hmm? Did you always tell that? Uh, yeah. But I quite prefer what was happening. I love to say the words that don't have the whole word or the most of them. Flavius Josephus is one of the most famous, who is, uh, you're, again, your ignorant college professor who would say, oh, Josephus, they just proved him long ago. No, they haven't. There are a couple of words that he maybe didn't write, but the section on Jesus is pretty authentic, and they have, they have actually uh, vindicated uh, his history as, as acknowledging this prophet Jesus. Um, uh, Mara Bar Serapion, uh, I believe a Jewish writing, and then the Talmud, which is kind of the Central writing of the Pharisee Jew Judaism post temple destruction, uh, setting the standard for Orthodox Judaism today. The Talmud mentions Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. Um, they mention him as a real historical figure. And so, for someone to say he doesn't exist is it's just gross, willful deception. And, and you can you can kind of say that, right? Uh, for the first time, I, I was a bartender in seminary. I and I remember someone having this conversation. Arms. Do you see me exist? I'm saying, you know, I don't really do that. No, that's just kind of ridiculous. I mean, I can read a couple books if you want. Not the Bible, Jesus loves the way. He didn't want it. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, you just don't know what you're talking about. It'd be nice as you say it, but it's true. They don't. They don't. And an honest atheist like Anthony Flew, I mean, I'm not going to quote Flew here, but all through the book, he's acknowledging these things I'm putting up here. He acknowledges that they're fair things to say scientifically and historically. Number two, this real human Jesus died by crucifixion and was buried. So these same extra-biblical sources mention his death. Uh, death and, and not just that he died, but that he also died. He died at the hands of Rome. Um, this is a historical fact with precedent in ancient literature besides the Bible. Um, the next one, we're not quite there yet, but the next one is a little tricky. So this guy Jesus, we know that he was 
killed for trying to set a path to follow him from Jerusalem. We know he had followers. And then we know from their sources that these followers took his death really hard. And this is where, if you're in this argument or this debate with the unbelievers, you have to be able to point to the Bible without saying the Bible is the word of God. First, the Bible is the eyewitness testimony of those people who believe in Jesus. And so, for the sake of this argument, you don't have to believe everything you said is true, but you do have to believe that they're speaking for themselves. So that when they say that they took it very hard and fled and hid after his death and were despairing, you don't have a reason to question that as their witness, as their testimony. We're not talking uh, spiritual truths here. We're talking historical events that after the, the, uh, Jesus was crucified, the disciples scattered. And Salu acknowledges this point. That's exactly it. These eyewitness accounts are fair in that. Um, the people who wrote these books are telling us at least what they thought was true. And when they're talking about their own reaction to the death of the guy they thought was the Christ, you need a pretty good reason to think to, to question their, their integrity on that. The tomb was empty. Three days later, extra biblical sources say things like that after Jesus was killed, quote, I believe this is Tacitus, uh, a most mischievous superstition again broke out. Uh, um, the mischievous superstition is that this guy is the Christ. Uh, uh, one Jewish document tells of a gardener named Judah who stole the body. Oh, I'm supposed to go find the source by looking at the book here. Um, so I can't get the source, I apologize. Um, a gardener named Judah who stole the body. Now, what's so fascinating about this? I, I, I've got to love this. You have a Jewish document from the early century saying that Christianity is false because the body was stolen. And so, accidentally, it's saying the tomb was empty. Yeah? So, it, you know, the, the document doesn't say Jesus was from the dead, but it does say the tomb was empty. Now, why would the Jewish authorities be saying the tomb is empty if it's not? But again, you have this extra biblical fact. The guy existed, the guy died, his tomb was empty. Right? Um, you with me so far? Then you have the real followers stop despairing and start telling people why they've stopped despairing. Again, this is not the Bible fell out of the sky and I believe it to be true. This is these guys wrote this stuff down. And so it's a source. And they're saying, um, both biblical and extra biblically, telling us that Christianity began because the same followers who had despaired believed that they had seen him risen from the dead and they began to preach this fact. Rather than give up this claim, the same disciples who once fled now willingly face gruesome and painful death. But if you're a historian, and you're, the job of the historian is to explain what happened on this planet before we got here. The only way to do this is to look at the evidence, the written down that we have. If you're a historian, you have to, if you're going to be honest about the rise of the Christian religion, where did it come from? You have to explain how these individuals who fled from the authorities suddenly aren't clean anymore. What convicts them to do this? Does that make sense? And it doesn't prove Christianity. But if you're going to be honest about saying Christianity is true, you've got to kind of come up with a reason other than Jesus doesn't agree. Because they're out there saying the reason that we won't stop talking is look at it. We must obey God better than men. It's because Jesus said we're going to die. So here we are. No, we're not going to stop talking. Well, what, what do you want me to do? Well, I saw him. He was walking around. Like, My feet are just hard. It's weird. What do we do? I can't deny that. This is, this is a fact. And, and Flew is, you know, he, he, he hems and haws on this one, but he acknowledges it in the book. Um, I love this. This is, it hinges on this so much. Um, antagonists convert for the same reason. Eyewitness accounts. James, Jesus' brother by blood, and Saul, a man who made a business of killing Christians, become Christian. 
and give as their sole reason face-to-face -face encounters with the risen Jesus. Again, you're talking to this history, right? We're just in the realm of facts. We're not in the realm of faith. Faith is, is not even in this discussion. We're just talking about what happened. And so you got this man Jesus. You know he was there. You know he died. You know his tomb was empty. You know these people are running around not afraid of dying because they think he's risen from the dead. And then you have people who never knew him or believed on him as Christ before his death, who in fact are antagonists, persecutors of those who believe he's risen from the dead, who suddenly change their mind. And the only reason they give is, I saw him. And you can question their integrity, but you, if you're going to, you've got to say, why? Why are you questioning Saul of Tarsus' conversion? Did he just go mad? Okay, well, how about James? How does a stolen body convert them? Right? And we'll come back to that idea in a moment. But it's, it's huge. It's absolutely huge for the historian, for the facts of history, that these individuals didn't just magically decide to follow an idea, but they are converted by an eyewitness um, meeting with the resurrected Jesus. And they're willing to die for it. Again. A man, a man who was so involved in his religion that he would go to the government and get documents to have him killed. Change his mind. As a historian, if you're going to be the atheist historian, you've got to explain science. You've got to give a reason. Imagine the source for Paul, what about James? You've got to prove it. Right? And more, really. These previous facts then are the singular foundation of Christianity. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, the rise of Christianity has no viable historical explanation. So this is like, we're talking history here a little bit, right? So you got world religions, and you got 0 AD, and you got Judaism, and you got Paganism of all its various strains, Hinduism's over in, in, uh, in India, and then out of nowhere, really, except for maybe Judaism, you have this new one that just skyrockets. And the only thing they're saying that happened is that he rose from the dead. So, well, you're saying that's not true, right? You're saying he didn't rise from the dead. Okay, then what happened instead? What convinced these Jews to, to stop being Jews? That's a point we're going to come to, too, in a moment. Um, so, in this, Christianity is not necessarily proof of Jesus' resurrection, but it is proof that those who were first Christians believed they had seen the risen Jesus. Yeah? You with me on that? It's kind of a, a loopy, loopy thought, but it, it is true. These guys thought they saw it. And the existence of Christianity to this day proves... They thought they saw him. And so if you're going to reject it and say they didn't see him, well, then what happened? Give me an alternative explanation for that empty tomb. Especially when it all happens in Jerusalem. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, I, I'm living now in a town of 1,600 people. I don't know what the size of Jerusalem was at this time. There's probably going to be 1,600. Um, I don't know how many of you sit back and... You can imagine. I don't know. Who's the most famous person in St. Catherine? Right now, sitting right here. Who? So, if, if Professor Winger <laughs> were taken by the authorities of the town and uh, hung from a tree, you know, and then we buried him. It's a cemetery, a little cemetery. And then someone came to you and said, you'll never believe it. Professor Ringer has risen from the dead. What's the most natural thing to do? <laughs> Go to the graveyard. Go to the graveyard. That's exactly right. Wait, no. Let's check it out. Right? That is to say, the last place in the world you're going gonna, you're gonna to begin a god myth about a man who died is where he died. I mean, it would have made sense to go to India and start doing this. Right? And create this Jesus cult, it doesn't make any sense to do this in Jerusalem, where the people who are there saw him and knew him. Yeah? 
No one in the small town where this all went down could present the body to disprove it. Instead, the stolen body theory is preached by the first skeptics. That's right there in Acts. Guys, you can look. Uh, the Pharisees tell the soldiers uh, to say the body was stolen. So immediately you have one alternative explanation for the empty tomb. Stolen body. We'll come back to that again. But then in Jerusalem, of all places, Orthodox Jews start worshiping on Sunday. Now, the Seventh-day Adventists are wrong in saying that Christians have to worship on Saturday, but they're right in this. Orthodox Jews do have to worship on Saturday. They're not allowed to change. Huh? New Christians, a bunch of these Orthodox Jews, give up Sabbath worship to meet on Sunday. Why? Because it's the day he rose from the dead. That can't be overemphasized enough. You, you, you are going to explain Christianity. You say you're an honest historian. I just want the facts. I don't want any of the spiritual juju. I don't want any of the faith. Well, okay, fine. So tell me where Christianity came from, please. How did all these Jews, who like for thousands of years are refusing to give up their backward religion, right? Nobody can get these guys to stop being Hebrews. They keep trying, but they're clinging to this Torah stuff. And then suddenly, oh, well, we're coming out. Oh, well, it's because Jesus rose from the dead. That's why. As an idea. I, I, with this with that, that one, I don't know how you explain that. If you take these pieces and do the math, the non Christian skeptic is really the one who needs to amass some proof or explanation for the facts if he desires to scoff at the Christian belief, particularly to call us unreasonable. What is the reasonable historical explanation that takes into account all these undeniable bits of archaeological and historical evidence? I have said nothing so far that you must take on faith. It is all a matter of documented evidence. Because the only way we know anything is if that was that way back before, right? How did this happen? The only way we came. So how do you explain what we know? In the last three centuries, only three explanations have been put forward all of which have generally been abandoned due to their inconsistencies. They are. The stolen body theory, the swoon theory, and the hallucination theory. Um, so, stolen body theory, we've already kind of gone over, we've kind of put that one forward, uh, we'll get into it again uh, in, in the Gospel. Um, the disciples went and stole a body, and that's how the tomb got empty. Some sort of Ponzi scheme. Um, the swoon theory is Jesus didn't really die. He was on the cross, he got up pretty bad, they thought he died, but he wasn't really dead. So he escaped from the tomb. Broke the seal. Um, and then the hallucination theory, I think it's my favorite, um, is that the disciples were so distraught by the loss of their, um, their leader, their Messiah, that they had a mass hallucination of grief together and convince themselves that uh, Christ was risen in the morning. Those are your three potential explanations. First, notice how every single one of them is in some of the facts. They didn't get the tomb every single one. Um, they didn't get the distance. They didn't get the followers. The important thing is that every single one of them doesn't look at all of the facts. And you can't kind of play with these together because they contradict each other. And I'll try to show you that in just a minute. That's what Clue does though when you read the, the book and the debate. He keeps bouncing between them. Like, oh, you can't like build them up together as if they work together. Why? Because the hallucinated disciple writes to you on the body. Right? Um, it still doesn't work that way. So, the piece of stolen body here doesn't explain Saul and James. How does that convince them to convert? Maybe explain Sabbath week. Maybe. But again, now you have these followers who were despairing and hiding, fleeing as soon as they see him crucified, and now suddenly they're going to create a bond scheme and get themselves killed. Changing over that week is a process. It's quite a stretch. You have like half the facts. 
それによってそれとも言います。そうですね。今日、ジェイズ、the mother of Jesus、and Jesus comes up to him and he goes, I'll live my hour now because he's he slowly he didn't die, he sent the spirit out of the devil in his heart, and so he goes, hey, I'm on the side. You know, and like Jesus is going to believe, he knew it from a kid. How do you convert your brother? He doesn't, he doesn't have this conversation with family members. You can't come and stand in the middle of the spiritual things. They're the last people that are going to believe. And the, the risen Jesus converts James by appearing to him. It's not going to be a swoon to Jesus. He's going to be like, Jesus, stop it. We thought you were mad before, and we think you're mad now. Stop it. Right? Right? And then you have to it's, it's like, it's a really important point. Much less Saul of Tarsus, who's convinced he had, I mean, the vision of light and all that stuff. How does a swoon body do that? To forget, I mean, Meanwhile, they're denying the fact that they won't admit that they actually died, which is a fact. They're trying to make that fact go away, but they died. They're going to blame their own soldiers. It's the most efficient killing machine almost in the history of mankind. Crucifixion was a science of torture. And the centurion tasked with overseeing this, if that should happen, if a man should not die on the cross and come down, he goes on the cross. Which is why they take the spear and shove it into his heart. And that's why water and blood flow out separately. This is when you die by asphyxiation. As you die, your heart is surrounded by a pocket that's a clear fluid. So it was science that would have pierced his heart so that they could see that fluid came out first. Oh, that means he's dead for sure. Yeah. Now, John, of course, in the Gospels, he's back to the middle of his cell. But that's a different point. The swoon theory. Again, this is the argument of a desperate. a desperate person. Man, that's exactly right. They are grasping at anything to try to not face the facts. Speaking of which, the hallucination theory in my favor is the least scientific of all possible explanations. There's a definition for hallucination inside your head. By definition, it did not be experienced. Um, <laughs> right? yeah. the, I know from um, friends and growing up in the area that you can take drugs and have a group experience. But that group experience is based on a mutual commitment to something you're doing together. And even then, you're not all seeing the same thing. You're all seeing different things, and then when you're sharing ideas, you're, you're, you're kind of affecting the, the event. Um, but even with that, I mean, you can imagine somehow that grief could cause this all at once with 12 to 500 people. Um, uh, you're really stretching the boundaries of fact and science. Um, and then again, so Paul just goes, in our world is fiction. You have to explain it. Um, which is why in the schools of thought that think about these things, it is recognized even by skeptics, not by all universities, but there are skeptics who write against these theories saying we need a better theory because this theory is going to hold it. Yeah. And so none of them are really clung to as an answer, but they will still be thrown out there as like, well, it could be this, it could be that, because, well, we don't want to face the facts. The best part of this book with Anthony Flew is, is how do us pushes him to this point, where he's saying, look, you got to face the facts. What is the reasonable explanation? The only reasonable explanation is that he rose from the dead. That's the only way to make sense of all these facts. And Flew gets to the point where he says, yes, I admit that is the only reasonable explanation, but I cannot believe it is true. So I'm like, God bless you. You at least know this. He has a priority decided, I won't believe. Now, what does this do for you, though? Again, for the next time someone comes at you about how Christianity is not facts, right? just know there's just as many things like us. We have a lot of facts. I don't think these facts can convert your friends to get into you. I have said to non Christians, they're going to be angry. Right? Um, don't, don't take my mode with you and go mimic that. I'm talking to Christians. Um, 
Some of these facts, if you get an agency that's curious and really wants to know, can help them slowly, but they are really in it. And part of that's going to come out of their own spiritual reality, their struggle with despair and the, the experience of law and knowledge in their life. Those are different topics, but that was the third thing I wanted to get to today. I don't think we're going to get there. Um, but you can at least know for your own sake when you see these assertions. Bill Maher makes this really good this movie, making fun of all of this dead work and all this little baby doing no anything. Um, you can notice for sure that we, we haven't just made this up. This wasn't done in the corner to quote, I think it's Peter. Um, you know what Paul it was in the corner. Peter, if you didn't follow the perfectly devised myths, this, is, this religion is unlike any other one. It, it is, and this is so cool. It is the only religion you can disprove. It's the only other one. It's like atheist. You can actually disprove it. Present the body of Jesus. It's gone. Um, and yet that was right. You can't present the body of Jesus. He's risen. Said, so talked about that already. Mm, how these don't work together. You can't steal a swoon body that gets up and walks away. Groups of people don't hallucinate the same vision in differing locations. Uh, Jesus, who needed to be taken to the hospital, would not have converted anybody. Uh, the simple reality, resurrection is the answer. Ah, Spock quoting Sherlock. Um, which then now, uh, what happened, so Spock in, in I think it's, the undiscovered country is the last original Star Trek movie. Maybe one was out of I'm not really a Trekkie, but I don't know. Um, uh, he quotes, he quotes Sherlock Holmes as they're trying to solve the mystery. And then the reason BBC Sherlock quotes Spock. <laughs> it's the same line. Um, but it kind of gets to the point. If you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be true. Now, now the, the skeptical thing with the impossible is the resurrection. I say, no, that's the improbable. Right? The impossible is the group hallucinations. The impossible is the soul body of dream. Right? That's impossible. The improbable is that he rose from the dead. But we've eliminated all the other impossibles. All we're left with is the resurrection. Thank God we already believe in it. You know? Keep it in your back pocket. Dear Mr. Scoffing Skeptic, Scoffing Skeptic, could you kindly explain Tacitus' remarks about this non-existent Jesus? Perhaps expose, ex expouse on the Jewish Talmud's reference to him as a sorcerer. Could you please take the time to consider all the actual facts before you boldly assert that I am just stupid and willing to believe everything? Anything. Excuse me. Faith alone does not mean blind faith. Our faith is in something. Uh, I, I heard a pastor recently say this. We can't prove the resurrection because it's got to be in the faith. I don't think that's quite right. Um, that, the, there, there's an eyewitness testimony. We can't, in a court of law, prove the resurrection. That's the most viable understanding of what took place. Our faith is not blind, uh, it is in something very real. Uh, blind faith is what paganism does. It, it just says, trust, and it'll work out. Put your hope out there, and it'll all come back to you. Um, I don't want to go on that too much, but how are we doing for time here? Oh, we got quite a bit of time. Um, more than an apology. 1 Corinthians 15. I love this. The end of this book, Corinthians is such a complicated, frustrating book because it's all about Christians who are idiots. Uh, <laughs> it's us, right? It's us, and they are just torn apart by their sin uh, to the extent that some of them really do need to be excommunicated. Um, although the whole conversation is, you know, can, can we convert him back again in 2 Corinthians? Um, but there's just so many horrible things going on. And Paul is trying pastorally to, like, bring them to an understanding of all this. He's not smacking them in the face. He's trying to lay down the boundaries, boundaries of the cross, for trusting the law and gospel in their totality. And he gets to the end of the book. I just love this turn of phrase. You know, I've, I've been talking about adultery. I'm talking about drunkenness at the Lord's Supper. Um, I'm talking about the foolishness of the world. But what I want you to remember is the gospel, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, because I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, 
that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Same preaching. Yeah? Now, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Right? Blind faith is futile. If he's not raised, we're wasting our time. If Christ, in Christ we have hope only in this life, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, and this is baptismal language, Romans 5 and 6, as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. As in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. Um, this is why, from an ultimate historical standpoint, the resurrection is the gospel itself. Forgiveness of sins is part of this. Um, but the, uh, the problem that we have is our slavery to the death within. That's what sin is. It's the death within that comes out of us. And so in Adam, we reject God. We leave behind his word. We cease to be under his words and put ourselves instead under the words of Lucifer, who was the great enemy. And as a result of this, are subjected to death. And Christ comes into the strong man's house, right? The prince of demons who rules this age as a king. And he binds up the strong man with his holy, precious blood. And then he walks out of the strong man's powerful prison of Hades. And no longer has dominion over it. He holds the keys. And he gives the keys to preach. To claim it. To give us sins in this name. All of us tied up in that body of a man no longer subjected to the devil. And baptism is you getting put into that body. And the Lord's Supper is that body getting put into you. So as we wait for the final day, when as children of the new Adam, you will have bodies made of the new Adam's life, children of heaven, as that word, bodies of heaven, um, we continue to proclaim this unalterable fact on which the entire contingent can rest. The Christ has been raised from the dead. Hallelujah. And they're going to scoff. Um, uh, there was a good question about the Spirit's work and the Philip's opposition, right? Um, kind of paraphrasing. <coughs> but yes, uh, um, so am I getting this right? The Spirit works in the Gospel and the Word of God? Yes. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, what about when it doesn't work? Okay, when we aren't converted. Uh, don't know the Spirit still works in that. He's not not working in the dreams of man. He may be working in the ways of the life. He may be writing them to create evidence. The gospel will do that to him. But the Spirit is always active in his work. The word is sent out and will not be returned away, but accomplish the task for which it was sent. So if we would see, I said this earlier, if we would see revival, and by the way, I simply mean Christians believing what they believe according to the scriptures. And why do we believe it? According to the scriptures, again. It begins with not a better method, not a better trick, not a better style of music. It begins with this central rule of faith being the thing we actually uh, are willing to die for. I mean, willing to speak out loud against the friends and neighbors and family. Uh, <coughs> let's go ahead and start with uh, some questions now. I, I think I still want to try to leave by 12 15, if that's okay. Um, so that gives us half an hour for you to respond to Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and recognizing that we may, we may be out of season. Um, oh, 
I'm just going to turn the mic. That, that way? Yep. Um, uh, when we're out of season, it doesn't change things. Yeah. Um, I want to speak more to your, uh, what you said about evolution and science. I mean, aside from, I mean, hello. Why a Christian can't believe in evolution? Because through a man came death. That's why. <laughs> um, death uh, and evolution are best friends. Uh, death is evolution of God. Survival of the fittest only works when everything that's weak is dying. And so if man comes from ape, comes from uh, amoeba, uh, that happens through millions and millions of years of death. In which case, death certainly can't come through Adam. So as a Christian, you have a reason besides Genesis 1 to reject macroevolutionary neo-Darwinianism. Um, uh, you know, the diversity of the species, the, the finch beaks, that's all fine. I mean, we, we don't have a problem with that. Um, so th there's that, but your, your question was connected to this argument you run into with the atheist, the scoffer, whoever it is, who again wants to make this claim just the facts, just reason, just what makes sense. I have no presuppositions, I only believe what I see. They're lying through their teeth. Absolutely. Uh, they have a presupposition, and they even will say it. Reason. Their presupposition is reason. That is to say, they have blind faith in reason. That is to say, they trust reason without having a good reason to do so. Yeah? And they have to. Because the moment I would try to prove reason, I would have to use reason to prove it. And so I have become unreasonable. It's called a circular argument. It's a simple rule of logic, uh, illogic. You can't do it in any argument. So you have no choice but to accept as an a priori, before any facts, assumption that reason is reasonable. So don't tell me you have no blind faith in anything. Where'd reason come from? Why does it make sense? Why do things seem orderly and, and, and put together? Why do you even have a word like design? Even talking about cars, isn't it all accident? It's all kind of accidentally crashed together over millions of years? I mean, even if you believe that evolution made us thinking beings who did it, the design still isn't the design, it's still a mistake. But they don't talk that way. Because they can't escape this. That there is, and now here's the thing, the Greeks called it the logos. The eternal reason. Which is the word, word, that then John says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. They need our God in order to argue against our God. Well, I think that they get the That's, that's what they want. But to, to get to that idea that there is no God, they need to borrow from him. That's, that's the crazy thing, right? They can't, they can't, from their own worldview, argue against our worldview. So if I'm in a conversation with an atheist, and he's, I mean, I, I want to always try to be nice and bring them along, so I try not to go this route, but if he's really going to push me on it, I'm going to say to him, I'm sorry, you keep trying to make a reasonable argument against God, but in your neo-Darwinian universe, there's no such thing. So until you come up with a different way to argue, I'm not going to listen to you. You keep borrowing from Christianity. You keep borrowing from a God of order and design in order to argue against him. So please, go back to the drawing board and come back with just the facts. Since you're saying that's all you're doing, quit assuming sense and logic. Those aren't things that you have in your toolbox. Until you explain where they came from. And if you believe in Nar Nar Neo I'll, I'll see you in the back. If you believe in neo-Darwinian evolution, that it's all action over millions of years, I mean literally, the, the, the electric electrical sparks firing in your brain, accidentally making emotions in you that lead you to believe you have thoughts, are the least trustworthy of all things. Even the thought that evolution is evolution is an accidental chemical reaction in, in your puppy head. How can you trust it? Right? And, I mean, I would, I would argue be as patient as you can with your friends and neighbors. They don't understand how much they've bought into this.
But at the same time, as you're patient with them, outwardly, inwardly understand that they are completely blind. They have no idea how little a foot they have to stand on, even in their own worldview. The Hindu has a far greater system. Seriously. They're, they're, they're the ones that have ideas that they don't have to explain because for them it's all the great, uh, not Nirvana, but the great, uh, the great spirit and its revolutions and whatnot. Um, at least then they can point to reason a little bit. Um, but they, man, they got a hard one. Um, go ahead in the back there. You have your hand up. Yeah? Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I can say something. Um, uh, I guess in our age, uh, some people who work with that understanding of science and reason and all that, but we also see psychology mm. is the, really the ruling philosophy of authority. And we have <coughs> examples of people believing crazy stuff because they end up in these cults. And you might, people could say that the disciples Right. And he said brainwashed them and they were ready to jump into any kind of conclusion to maintain that. Right, that's the, that's basically the mass hallucination theory. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So one one good thing to remember is that first of all, the gospel testify that disciples didn't understand what Jesus was saying when he said that he's going to yeah. die and rise again. Yeah. They didn't accept that. And and they weren't brought up to believe that there would be a Christ. Uh, who would actually be the Son of God right. and who would die and rise right from the dead. Right. Their whole Jewish upbringing uh, didn't prepare, prepare them for that, but actually otherwise. So when they believed in the resurrection of Christ, they had to go against everything they had to be right. before that. Yeah. And, that, and that's what we get out of the Third Commandment, Sabbath day stuff. And I mean, it sounds nice, right? It's, it, Jesus brainwashed them in the cult, so after he died, they thought he rose, even though he didn't, because they were prepared for that. He tricked them into running away and then coming back and believing they saw him. Great, James and Saul. You still have not explained James and Saul. Yeah? Um, so it's, it's, it's amazing that they'll take this idea and go, now we'll, we'll twist it a little, we'll put it in new shoes and a nice new coat and throw it out there. Oh, look, it's, it was cultic behavior, yeah? It, it, there's not that much new to these thoughts. It's been thought through so hard by the Germans. You know the Germans, they do anything, they do it all the way. <laughs> um, and, and so it's, it's not like there's new ideas we're going to find here. Um, the work's been done. Um, so thank you. That's a good point. I'll come back to you in a moment. You mentioned psychology and made me think of therapy. So we live in a psychological culture. We live in a therapeutic culture where most people, when they talk about spirituality, which they try to say is not religion, what they're really talking about is therapy. They're really talking about trying to find good healing, trying to find some kind of healing or even wellness. Which now I hear Christians talking about this too, wellness. Um, first off, spirituality is religion. It's just private or subjective. Versus public and objective. So when you say I'm not spiritual, I'm not religious. I'm just spiritual. You're saying I don't want to have anyone else believe what I believe, or be able to tell me that I'm wrong. That's basically what you're saying. Um, I would contend that Christianity is both spiritual and religious. We have external objective realities that also impact our internal spiritual experience. That's the best of both worlds. But when they want to reject the public border of, of any uh, kind of group-held idea. Um, they claim to the individual spirituality instead, and yet they, they are uh, receiving the religion of the age, which is therapy. Um, often through moralism, and usually with some idea of an unnamed God thrown in. The moralistic therapeutic deism, I didn't come up with this, Christian Smith, uh, a Duke professor, I believe, might be North Carolina, um, just calls this the, the, the religion of America's teenage population. Uh, no matter what denomination they're in, uh, that's what they believe. Um, God wants me to be happy if I'm good. Uh, and they, they chase after that. I guess 
On the one hand, it's clearly wrong, but the thing is, the sucker is so pervasive. It's in so much of our churches. I walk through a Christian bookstore, and 97% of the books are about therapy, about how to feel better. Um, now, don't get me wrong, I'd like to feel better, too. That's why I didn't wish <laughs> I think spiritualism is also kind of giving them the freedom to reject the truth of Christ right. and create actually their own deity. Yes. So we're back to what the Greeks do and say, okay, well, let's cover everything, cover the bases, and including covering the unknown God, but covering right. all the bases, right? Yep. So they like Jesus and just fine. Many discussions with people that we have and came to that point saying, you know, God, him and her, him or her, you know, right. and so now you're talking about the, you know, the, not the proclaiming of, of, of the, the truth of the Bible, right. but they try to create their own God. I said, well, you, you can't really do that because you are creating your own God, and it doesn't mean that you are an atheist, you actually believe in something, and right. you're making it up as you go along, right? right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so the autonomy of the individual, to be a rule unto themselves, is what they're seeking. Yeah. And then they're making a God in their own image. Mm -hmm. right? Which is sort of what we've always done since the fall, is we made God in our likeness rather than recognize we were made in his likeness. Uh, you see this with the Romans. Why did the Romans make all those beautiful statues right, of the gods? Why do all the gods look like humans? <laughs> they're making God in their image. Um, I saw a meme uh, just the other day. You guys know what a meme is? You know what they are, even if you don't know what it's called. It's, it's like you're on Facebook or Twitter or somewhere, and there's a picture, and it's got words on it, right? And it's like a joke, right? Um, and so uh, it's called a meme. I, forget, I don't know where the name came from, but it was Jesus is sitting there, and he's got his arm around Buddha and some other god, and there's like all these other gods running around behind Jesus. He's smiling in front of him. And, uh, and the meme said, um, uh, there are millions of religions practiced in the world, but don't worry, yours is the only right one. And it was, it was meant to scoff. Right? It's scoffing at the idea. Um, what I found fascinating about this idea that Jesus is just another part of the pantheon was the argument itself was basically there's lots of people who have been wrong, so there can't ever be anyone right. That was their argument. Which, again, philosophically makes even their own meme not funny anymore because they're asserting a rightness they're asserting that they're right and saying we're wrong. And yet by avoiding an actual reasonable argument and instead just making fun of you, they get to exercise their willful power over you without ever having to make sense of it. Which is very much our postmodern age. I'm throwing all these keywords up here. Our postmodern age is the age ruled by the will to power. I'm going to spell Nietzsche wrong because I always do. It's got like a Z and a CH and an S and a bunch of stuff in there. Dr. Weir knows probably. Um, Nietzsche coined this phrase, the will of power. Uh, the uber mensch. I don't know why they translated that as superman. It should be great man, because it makes more sense. That the big man, the strong man. Uh, that whoever is most capable of convincing you by any means necessary, he is the one who is true. Because there is no truth. And so the meme, for them, is an honest argument even though it has not a single reasonable thought in it. Um, <laughs> uh, what a world, huh? And what do we do? Christ has been raised from the dead. That's what we do. I can't convince you of this. I can't force you to believe this. But it's not unreasonable for me to say so. And I do, I do believe it. Where I don't have a ton of experience. Uh, we do have a Missouri Synod gentleman named Adam Francisco. He's a professor at Concordia University, Irvine, who is one of the leading American scholars on Islam. Um, and uh, uh, I would recommend looking into his resources because he has done a great deal of work. Um, there's another gentleman named Brian Katchelmeyer uh, who also has done quite a bit of work. Um, my understanding, what little I have, is that the majority of people who are Muslim in America are Muslim the way that Catholics are Catholic. That is to say, mom and dad are Muslim. I don't eat pork. Um, and so they don't have a lot of understanding. Uh, 
Uh, I think that accusing them of being terrorists is not the way to start the conversation. Uh, um, I say that as a joke, but there's a, there's a point at which in any conversation you're going to have with somebody, um, it does help to build a little trust, uh, especially, I say, in our day and age. It's not required. It's clearly um, uh, Paul walking in the streets is converting people just by saying it. Um, but trust goes a long way in getting someone to give you a, a hearing. And then the other thing with, with Islam, it's, it's like anything, though, too, is that you're going to have to be able to engage what they think they believe reasonably. And so what I have heard from apologists who do this is um, they try to make sure that they have in their back pocket the things the Quran says about Jesus. Because you can prove from the Quran that Jesus is perfect, that he's going to return to defeat the Antichrist. Um, you can't prove he rose from the dead because they don't think he died. Um, but you can show that he was a great prophet. And then you can ask, well, why don't you listen to his words? And their answer is, well, those words have been, have been uh, uh, twisted. Have you read them? <laughs> Before I go, have you read them? Will you read them with me? What I did with you this morning, I thank you whoever said that to me. Someone came up to me and said, thank you for opening the text. We need to do that more often. Yes! It's amazing. Just read the Bible. <laughs> you know, um, enough with these, like, uh, you know, multiple choice tests and, and you know, confirmation. I, I'm just dis distraught by how little these kids are learning. I think part of it is we've, we've taken doctrine out of the Bible. And we're trying to teach it over here, and the Bible's over here, and there's a place for that. But, but for growth in Christianity, and particularly for conversion of the soul, open the text with me. And so ask, ask the Muslim, would you like to read the Gospel of Matthew with me? And you read through it. And let the text, which is where the Holy Spirit works, do, do his work. It doesn't prove or guarantee anything, but you don't have to rely on yourself to convert people. You have your creed, and you have your New Testament. And if you can't know the whole New Testament, get to know either Matthew or John really well, and get to know Romans really well. Golly, it's all you really need. I mean, if I take two of you with me to an island, there's two of you, three. Um, yeah, in the back. Uh, I just wanted to apologize to Sandra about uh, accepting Jesus as a Quran Yeah. Uh, the only time which I have to give it a personal but in mind, my father was a Muslim <laughs> who was being raised to become the Imam of a mosque. Huh. And uh, he read the Quran, and through that he got to know Jesus Christ. Huh. That convinced him that what he was following was not the correct way. Huh. And therefore, he learned more about Jesus Christ, and then he had to leave his family for the night. So that's just an affirmation of. But there yeah. is, yeah, there is. And for creation, uh, there's a very good saying that if men or human beings evolved from apes and monkeys, why do we still have apes and monkeys? Yeah. 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 I, I was in the Fargo Airport for an extra hour or two, and uh, um, they had this, this display of these animals from North Dakota. That are, you know, North Dakota's got an uh, interiority complex, so they're ready to play out how great they are. And all these animals that are just here, and there's this big sturgeon fish, and it was talking about how this sturgeon was swimming at the time of the dinosaurs, and it's just kind of like, can you guys put this together at some point? Because maybe you haven't changed so much. Um, yeah, why, why would the humans evolve anymore? Yeah. <laughs> well, haven't you seen X-Men? <laughs> <laughs> um, there was on Issues Etc., if you don't know Issues Etc., I commend it to you. Issuesetc.org, Lutheran online talk radio for the thinking Christian. You can listen to it all week while you're driving. I can almost guarantee you, as close as a pastor can ever promise something that's not promised in Scripture, you will benefit spiritually from listening to this show if you do it over time. It will grow your faith. Anyway, it has someone on, a guest, um, who was a pastor in... Um, uh, Berlin, I believe, uh, Germany, uh, talking about the growth of this congregation from 15 to over 300 in the last two years, all of them Muslim converts. Really cool stuff. Talking about the what they call secret Christianity in Iran, um, where, where many of these converts are from, which are individuals who basically have a smuggled Bible 
and are meeting in private groups to study that Bible, but by day will not admit that they're Christians, but they are attempting to leave the country. Many of the refugees in Europe right now are connected. It's not all of them, but some of them. Um, and uh, it's, it's really kind of neat. And then as they're coming to this, this Lutheran church, um, it's kind of neat too how they basically are acknowledging they don't really know anything. All they have is the Bible, they have no one to teach them. And so when he starts pointing to baptism and the supper, which is brand new as an idea to them, they believe it. They're, they're Christians, and there it is in the scripture. And it's really a neat, neat story. Um, it is a weird phenomenon. I've also, Adam Francisco will talk about, this is the guy from Irvine, there is a, a bizarre trend um, among the Islamic world to have these dreams uh, at, in which they, they are told to go find out more about Jesus. And that's happened. Uh, and it's hard to reckon with because this is really entirely outside of revealed knowledge that we have. Um, it's almost like, I guess I would compare it to the Magi in the start. Uh, which, if you think about it, they shouldn't have gotten to the right place with the star. That was the wrong thing to do. The age of the stars and tell the future. You're not supposed to do that. Yeah? But they do. And it brings them to a place where they're given the word of God when they find Christ. Well, what's happening is many of these uh, Muslims are then finding in these secret chat rooms online uh, where they're asking quest questions of Christians and getting answers. So they are being driven to the word. Uh, Brian Katzelmeyer, whose name I mentioned before, his online missionary work that he does, quietly, privately, uh, is just that. He, he's involved in these chat rooms, uh, giving answers to them. So it's not like they're unconvertible. Um, in, in many ways, some of them are hungrier than anybody else. They're certainly more hungry than your, your lazy American, atheist, agnostic, uh, licentious, epicurean friend who just wants to go fishing every weekend. Uh, find God in the sunshine. Um, they're, they're so hard. I, I weep for my, my generation. Uh, we're so hard. God willing, we'll get some suffering in this country and uh, your country, my country, the country. <laughs> on this continent. Uh, <laughs> what you talk about with, with Muslims that are hungry for something else. Yeah. Um, something I read online in the last week or so was about uh, Christians in Russia who are so, or people in Russia who are so fed up with the uh, with the endless, or not, the endless isn't the word I want, uh, the, the, the hopelessness of evolution yeah. and the hopelessness of, of, of life with no God, um, that, that they, 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 they run to the Savior. Yeah. And, and I think what you're saying is that the same thing is happening in some of these Muslim countries. They are so, uh, they are beginning to realize the emptiness of the gods they have. Right. Yeah, Allah's not a god you want to run into. <laughs> really. You want to keep a real low profile. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, now, with all that said, and I've heard the, the Russian stuff too, I think it's important to remember that Jesus wasn't lying when he said the way is narrow. And few find it. And the road of perdition is wide. Um, so, you know, you got a Lutheran congregation with 300 Muslims out of 100,000 in there. And maybe a couple other Christian congregations, but there's still a massive number that aren't on the world. Don't get a, a glory theology out of this. The world isn't going to just wake up and be Christian tomorrow. It, it's never going to be Christian. The world is going to go to hell. Um, you're not. And that's good news. And the people who are finding this good news are those who are becoming Christian. So if we would be a missionary church, which I, I, I would call that just to be a confessional Lutheran church, which means you're going to speak out loud, you're going to confess what the scriptures say, um, if we're going to be part of that, uh, then being ready to give this answer about the resurrection, it has to be on our lips uh, when people wonder why. Why are you a Christian? Why don't you believe in homosexual marriage? Because Jesus is risen from the dead. But I didn't ask that question. Yeah, but you can't understand my answer. So you understand my answer. Why don't you believe in evolution? Because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. How can you say that? Well, let's look at it. <laughs> yeah? We'll get them to look at that before we try to convert them to everything else. Um, made me think of something else that I forgot. It. Um, I think we're probably at a good point. I really have enjoyed this. I hope you have too. Um, I'm not looking forward to going back to the airport, but I need to. <laughs> and uh, uh, God's peace to you. Thanks.
thank you for yeah. coming up here and during the uh, fun and games of airport security and life. Yeah, right. uh, a, a small token. Thank so you. Thank you. Yeah. And we'll get the other part yet to as okay. well get that. So that's cool. forthcoming. Uh, but thank you. Yeah. So there's food out there. Please, uh, once you get there, do the yeah. stuff, grab some stuff, and uh, your ride will encourage you to do some around here. You might get to that door. <laughs> so find him, and he'll get you uh, back to the joy that is airport. Thanks, <laughs> 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 <laughs>